Welcome everybody to session 44, if you can believe that, of Libraries in Recovery, or what we used to call, what is a library if the building is closed? That's still kind of what we're talking about. Even if libraries are open, they're partially open, they might close again. We're in a sort of a dynamic state here uh, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, we started these in March of last year just as a, as a kind of a rapid response to, to what was clearly uh, a crisis, even as we didn't know what it actually was or how severe it was or how pervasive. And so, uh, but we did know we were closed. We were in lockdown all of a sudden once the back pandemic was declared. And so for us, the, the immediate question was, okay, well, what does that mean to libraries delivering services? Because they're not all through the front door. Obviously, uh, most of you are aware how, how, uh, how big of an increase in demand for digital services have been, uh, you know, 50, 100% increase. Uh, and that's been great. People have really benefited from that, patrons. Uh, and at the same time, they have uh, suffered from a lack of access to the library facilities themselves, which so many tens of millions of people uh, depend upon. Uh, for all the various reasons that libraries provide uh, services. Uh, so we've carried on since then. It, it has just rolled from one topic to another. We looked at uh, internet access as one of, those, one of those services, one of those attributes that was affected by the, uh, by the pandemic, uh, digital services, ma physical materials, uh, not our strength uh, in terms of what we've uh, we as gigabit libraries have worked on but still uh, obviously a relevant aspect of a, of a closure uh, and then also social infrastructure which of course is it's like a hidden thing right in front of you uh, an important aspect of libraries so uh my name is don means we are the gigabit libraries network uh, global affiliation of libraries doing innovative things with technology and specifically mostly around uh, communications and how libraries have been using new kinds of communications technology, technology to extend access to this really important, let's say essential service of not only just internet access, but access to library digital services. Our partner in, in uh, crime here is the International Federation of Library Associations Institutions, IFLA. IFLA.org. IFLA is uh, based in The Hague in the Netherlands and is uh, hosting and recording these sessions, which are all now uh, uh, archived and available uh, on giglibraries.net. You see there at the bottom of the, of the screen uh, under the pandemic response page. And these are all now being uh, transcribed for closed caption and translated into over a dozen languages thanks to a wonderful intern we have brought on board from the University of South Carolina High School. Our session sponsor today is Kelly Dry Warren, LLP, a DC law firm specializing in E-rate, who have been helping us with filings and who have helped uh, have been part of our recent workshops. We've had a pretty intense series over the past couple of weeks all around the various uh, programs and especially the, uh, the emergency E-rate fund. Uh, today, we're going to go more wide on those uh, with our special guests, uh, which are Jen Nelson, state librarian from New Jersey. Welcome, Jen, for the first time. And Jenny Stapp, state librarian from Montana. Welcome, Jenny. Hi, hi, Bo. Uh, hi Jen. Hi, everyone. Lots of familiar names out there. It's good to, good to virtually see you all. Great. So, um, uh, beyond the parking lot, it seemed like I didn't quite update the title of our session. That was a recent one because that's what we've been talking about for the past year plus is uh, uh, serving people with Wi-Fi in the parking lot. And of course, we think you should go on beyond that. But uh, nevertheless, we do have uh, our excellent speakers. Uh, as usual, uh, we start with the COVID report, if you'll bear with me, uh, since this is the context for this whole series and what is clearly uh, almost overnight transformation of global civilization in response to what this virus is allowing us to do. Uh, it's just astonishing. And 
somehow we're adapting to it, but I guess that's what we do as humans. The vaccines this is phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's extremely uh, extraordinary that these have been developed in short, such short time. Many, many viruses, uh, diseases have never found a vaccine. AIDS does not have a vaccine, it has some treatments. Uh, HIV is what I mean. Uh, the variants are not so good. These, this, is a, this is a looming question. At first we get worried and then we go, well, it's, maybe it's not that bad because it seems like the vaccines are protecting us if you are vaccinated, which is a key here. So there are, you know, we've hit about, we've hit over half the US population uh, with vaccines and the daily case number now is around where it was at the peak of the last summer, which we thought was astonishingly high, but little did we know it was gonna, you know, more than uh, increase more than five times that over the winter. Uh, but so we're making extraordinary progress. Uh, over 200 million uh, shots have been given uh, in the last oh, 100 days or 90 days, I think. So we're making good progress here. Fortunately, you know, it's a wealthy country. However, India is now uh, just out of, out of control, completely running amok. That's what that's a number higher than what we peaked in the US. Now, India, of course, has over a billion people, but still it was, you know, a month ago it was 25,000. So it's just spiking and completely out of control. All the systems in India are completely overwhelmed. Interestingly, India is a place where most of these vaccines are being manufactured. So maybe that works for them, but uh, to uh, point out or recapitulate here what uh, Dr. Larry Brilliant said that there's, there's no way we can really stop our risk unless we stop it everywhere because you can imagine, I mean, the whole thing with the variants is that these viruses mutate constantly. And the more there are, the more chances they have to mutate. And the vaccines, while wonderful, are essentially static. And they just sit there and the virus tries to resolve its way around the vaccines, the antibodies, and, and they do what viruses do. And they're really good at it. So this is a kind of a race, if I may, against that. Uh, here's the, the latest graph for the US. You can see we're kind of lumbering along there at a very high rate, but at least it seems to be steady and not going up and hopefully going down. But you know, there's a lot of hesitancy out there about the remaining uh, vaccines. This is a graph from India. Just kind of makes my point uh, there that that just about a month ago it was around 30 uh, 30,000 cases and now it's it's uh, 300,000 and it's growing about 10 percent a day that's just abominable we wish them luck we wish us all luck so uh, now back to the session which is titled uh, state library agencies, the key to national recovery. So that's, we pose that as a question, not to load up our state librarians with solving everything, but to try to point out how relevant this position is and these offices are to the recovery. And that's largely because they're these new funds that are these new federal amazing quantities of money from the federal government are often flowing through the states it's easier for the federal government to say, let's print another trillion dollars and we want it to do kind of A, B and C, but to actually do that, we want the states to do it, so here. But that means a lot, the states have to figure out how to do all these things and, and uh, translate the, the directives that are in the law and then agencies like the FCC or IMLS have to further narrow the, the law into actual programs and, and processes. So it's incredibly complex, but uh, it seems to be landing on the state libraries. This is just a list of, of uh, new funding sources. It's just, it's a lot. So um, this, is, this is a kind of the internet coverage graph, uh, which puts uh, New Jersey near, at, actually at the top, now this is not the libraries, this is just the whole state. So this is, these are not the responsibilities of the state library. As a matter of fact, it's the responsibility of the state library to fill in all the gaps that are not filled by the traditional services and business models. And then Montana is 
near the bottom. And that's, there's a reason for that is that's because Montana basically doesn't uh, have any coherent strategy. I'm, I'm quoting them here. Uh, Jen Nelson, New Jersey says, we've got a good sense of what the needs are. And she apparently has a sense of uh, how these can be uh, addressed. Jenny states that without a coherent state strategy and a, and a coordinated approach, which usually means some kind of a state broadband commission, uh, it's really, really difficult. And, and this seems to be the spirit of Montana to kind of go it alone. But this is not really good for networks. Networks are not a alone kind of a phenomenon. They're kind of a group phenomenon, if you will. So with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to our speakers, uh, Jen and Jenny. Uh, thank you both so much for coming. And thank you all, by the way, for your patience in finding the correct uh, <laughs> address for the Zoom. Um, Jen, welcome. Uh, I think you're going to take us out, right? You're going to lead us off and give us the, the New Jersey story. Yep. yep, I sure am. Thank you, Don. Okay. Um, just before we get started, I want to, I do want to welcome everybody for joining us. Um, and Jenny and I have three thank yous we'd like to say. Um, one to you, Don, for convening this group and being a persistent presence during the pandemic that people can rely on. And for all the great work you've been doing over the years, I was telling Don earlier, I've been a, a closet fan and stealth looker of his work over the years. <laughs> I've totally enjoyed that. Jenny? Yep, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Again, in addition to thanking Don, I just wanted to put in a plug for COSLA, the chief officers of state library agencies. Jen and I both have the privilege of serving on the COSLA board. And I think Tim Cherubini, our executive director is online today, hey Tim. Uh, it's really through this organization that we are really able to collaborate and share ideas and expertise with one another. And um, you know, as we've all shared the, the joys and struggles as we've gone through this pandemic, COSLA has really been there for Jen and myself. And so I just really wanna thank that organization. I think the other reason why it's important to be aware of COSLA in today's discussion is that COSLA is the organization that um, of, of state libraries and we are really closest on the ground to the work of public libraries in our states. Don mentioned earlier that so much of the federal funds are being directed to the states because the states are closest on the ground to what the needs are in those states. And the state libraries in our states are really that equivalent for library services. And so we're really fortunate to have the opportunity to work with IMLS to, to strategize about how we best use the funds that are coming to support libraries. Jen? Thanks, Jenny. Um, and then the final thank you, of course, that we wanna provide is to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, we wouldn't be having this conversation today if it weren't for them. They've been stalwart in advocating uh, to the extent that they can advocate and supporting uh, funds coming to libraries throughout the whole pandemic and uh, have just been a fabulous organization to work with in terms of helping state librarians understand how we can spend the money when we have to spend it and what some of the criteria are. Um, Jenny and I kind of wanted to have a conversation today um, rather than doing a lecture kind of thing. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on a little more detail than Don gave on IMLS's appropriation. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, New Jersey, a little bit about Minnesota, where I just came from, as well um, as Jenny will talk a little bit. And then we posted some questions for each other, but we're wide open to your questions as well. We're here to be of service to you. With that in mind, um, IMLS was recently awarded um, the $200 million that Don showed. Of that, $178 million uh, was dedicated to the Grants to States program. The Grants to States program operates under the auspices of the Library Services and Technology Act, which sort of is an overlay for the, how the funding can be used and what its purposes are. And, um, it's a population-based uh, allocation. So larger, uh, more populous states receive more money, less populous states receive less money. I think there was a floor this time of a million dollars per state. Um, somebody 
I have a few IMLS colleagues with us. So if I'm getting facts wrong, please feel free to chat in and, and let me know that. Um, when uh, the money came out, of course, uh, our libraries were excited in the state of New Jersey. Um, we do, well, all states receive an annual allocation from the Grants to States program. In New Jersey, it's about $5 million. Um, and uh, the CARES Act, or excuse me, the ARPA funds, we received um, just under four million. So it pretty much is doubling the amount of money we have to spend in a year. Um, and uh, with the guidelines that are out there, we do have to have all funds expended by September 30th, 2022, which is a moderately short uh, time to use, but we're grateful for that, for the opportunity. Um, there are no matching requirements for this particular program. So we don't have to demonstrate that our states are spending a particular amount of money on libraries during the pandemic in order to qualify or be eligible for these funds. IMLS uh, would, uh, did a nice job of putting out some guidance for state libraries on how the funds can be used and what their priorities are. And just briefly, um, the first priority, and I'm just gonna read from the document here, is to enable libraries to reach residents with internet hotspots, accessible Wi-Fi, and other digital inclusion efforts, particularly in support of education, health, and workforce development. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about IMLS is that they are encouraging us to be data-driven organizations, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about New Jersey. The second uh, purpose is to provide rapid emergency relief to libraries, allowing them to safely respond to the pandemic and to implement public health protocols. In the shorthand vernacular, we call that the PPE provision. Um, and then... Third, to support library services that meet the needs of communities throughout the U.S., including costs such as personnel, technology, training, materials, supplies, equipment, and associated indirect costs. And with respect to each of those, um, we are encouraged to reach tribal and museum partners who are positioned to uh, join us in responding to the pandemic. Uh, as we're able to, not all states have the ability to um, provide grants, which we'll talk about, um, but to the extent that we're able to partner, um, another thing that I really appreciate about IMLS is they encourage these partnerships. Libraries are just one institution among a learning ecosystem in a state, and um, it, they can be a primary one, but we're only as strong as the partnerships and relationships that we build along with it. Um, with respect to uh, New Jersey's planning, um, we're still in a planning stage, so anything I say is subject to change based on feedback we receive from the library community. And that's probably been a key principle for how I've approached these funds, is really working with and hearing from the library community in terms of what the needs are. And it's no surprise that they're all over the map. Um, everything from a library that needs um, new catalog computers, plain and simple. Um, to uh, pro programs that, um, would, that have been suggested that would provide uh, digital navigators or economic navigators in libraries across the state. Um, a lot of interest in, um, uh, in digital inclusion, which I know is uh, an important component for IMLS as well as for the states, um, as well as um, Inclusion for the states. Um, interest, um, the two largest interests though have been in construction and in operating costs, which um, we are not able to use the funds for. Um, construction is one that kind of tears at your heart a little bit because it would be nice to have the resources to uh, be able to use them for libraries to build new computer labs or to build new spaces um, to uh, quarantine materials and that kind of thing, but it's, it's simply not an option. So as I think about uh, working in New Jersey, I see a couple of different um, areas that we can respond to. Um, we have, um, with the CARES funds that we received, purchased some subscriptions to online resources. And we've heard from the library community that some of those are of interest for continued uh, subscriptions. So we'll be look, moving ahead on that with a couple of items. We'll be looking at some uh, internal projects uh, in terms of outreach. Um, most of the state libraries have the Talking Book and Braille Center or Braille and Talking Book Library, one, one or the other, but the same organization. Um, and we're looking at doing some outreach um, from that library 
to blind users who read Braille. There's a new uh, product out um, through the Library of Congress called Braille e-reader, and um, we're looking at making those available to people as a way to get access to reading materials. Um, if you've ever seen Braille, it takes, you know, six volumes of Braille to uh, one novel, one 200-page novel, so the space limitations are pretty significant there, as well as it's hard to take on a trip with you. Um, and we're also looking at providing grants to our libraries so that um, the local needs can be met within the parameters that IMLS has set out. And then also looking at the potential for a statewide project that would uh, work in that general large area of literacy. Um, and I think as I heard the need for construction, I heard the need for uh, operating funds. I also heard the need um, for libraries to be able to do what they needed with that with the resources. And one of the approaches that we're taking in terms of thinking about how we can best support the state, Don showed the map that um, identifies New Jersey as having really high connectivity. I think it's up to 98% of people have access to the internet. That doesn't say it's affordable or um, reliable or the speed that people need, but there is basic connectivity. So our needs are a little different than the state uh, in the state as opposed to Montana. We also, um, uh, we also are taking a data-driven approach to looking at the resources we're making available and have, um, we'll be working with a university faculty member from Rutgers University to look at um, economic indicators uh, for the different municipalities in the state and identify both um, economic uh, unemployment, uh, those sorts of figures. And what he'll be doing is overlaying uh, information about digital inclusion on that. So we'll be able to look at communities and see what the specific needs are because we know there are needs even if they're not for the strict broadband. So in summary, that's what we're looking at in, the, in New Jersey, excuse me. Um, Jenny, I know you're taking a little different approach to how you're doing it. Do you wanna give everybody an overview? I do. Um is it Jenny, all possible? Jenny, let me interrupt and, yes. and say that it's, you know, uh, Jen and I are meeting for the first time on this session. You and I have known each other for a number of years. Yeah. And of course, I've been a fan of yours ever since I first met you. But uh, we, we share a, a history with Shelby and, uh, and you have been active uh, on all fronts within COSLA, within Shelby. And so... It's just great to have you on for the first time to see you again. Thank you, Don. I love being here. It's great to see you as well and so many of my other friends and colleagues from around the country. Would it be at all possible to make me the presenter? I just had a, a couple of quick dashboards I wanted to share. Sure. Is that, is that possible? Stephen has the controls, I think. You may have us on autopilot now. Uh, no, you are. Okay, you're good. Great. You should be able to share now. All right. Yeah. I hope people can see some, some dashboards. I just quickly wanted to give you a little bit of context for what we're doing in Montana. Uh, Jen mentioned being sort of a, a data-driven enterprise. And I, I think that's really important for all of us and uh, just wanted to give you just a little bit of context. Um, the other thing that's important to know about the Montana State Library is that in addition to supporting library development around Montana, we're also the organization that is responsible for managing our state's mapping data, our geographic information systems. And so in that capacity, it was the State Library that launched the Montana COVID response dashboard. And I wanted to just quickly give you a look at what that looks like. So uh, this is the primary portal for all information maintained by the state of Montana about the COVID pandemic in Montana. Um, the, one of the primary points right now is our vaccination response and looking at the a number of people that are currently vaccinated in our state and doses that are going out. Um, the vaccination data is updated weekly. Uh, in addition, we have um, our COVID 
piece counts. Uh, this was what the dashboard originally started as, and we added the vaccination response in January. And uh, so this has been a, a really useful tool for us to know as we've looked at various policies in the state that included per capita case counts and that kind of information has been this tool that the state has used to make those kinds of determinations. This data is updated on a daily basis. And so we're really proud to maintain this dashboard for the state of Montana. Wow. Uh, I also wanted to mention that um, we've maintained a Montana status map uh, that shows the status of libraries, whether they're open or closed, whether they're offering uh, different kinds of services. So if they're open by appointment, if they have uh, physical circulation, if they are offering computer usage or curbside services, this is a place where uh, people can go to check the status of library services in their community or if they're traveling around the state. We have 82 public libraries in Montana. And so right now we have 81 of our 82 public libraries sharing their status. Uh, and as that status changes, we encourage them to go out and provide this information. Talking more specifically about uh, some of our other kinds of COVID response, um, you heard Don talking about broadband needs as well as digital content and e-learning resources. And that's really been our focus in terms of how we've spent the CARES money that we originally received and where we will focus uh, our funding with the American Rescue Plan Act funds that come into Montana. One important note that I wanted to make, and, and this point is true for a few other states as well. Montana's Legislative uh, Assembly is currently in session in Montana. They meet every other year for 90 days. And while they are in session, they have the authority to appropriate any monies that come into the state. And so in addition to going through the federal process to receive the award and following the guidance that's been provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we also have to get authority from our state legislature before we can spend any of these federal funds. And they get to weigh in on what some of those priorities are. They don't get to determine priorities that are outside of the federal guidelines. They're frustrated, for example, by the 2022 deadline, we have to spend the IMLS funds, um, but they can't go beyond those deadlines. They can't change the priorities that are coming from IMLS and other federal entities that are responsible for creating the parameters by which we can spend these funds. But they can say to the state library, we think these are the priorities that you should focus on. And uh, the priorities that they have currently outlined align with the priorities that uh, we've suggested, including hotspot lending, uh, a focus on broadband connectivity within libraries, uh, especially some of the internal wiring needs in libraries, and then a focus on procuring and creating new digital content. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so just one more little hurdle that we have to go through. Um, the legislation that the Montana legislature is currently looking at uh, will likely pass next week. And then we'll have a little bit more freedom to start moving forward. Um, and I, as I said, I know there's a few other states that have those same kinds of processes that we have to go through. In Montana, we don't do any kind of subgranting with our federal funds. That's true of all of our grants to states funds. We support statewide programs instead of subgranting. And that's the model that we continue to use with our CARES Act and with our ARPA funds. So to the extent possible, we invest those monies into programs and services that benefit 
not just public libraries, but all types of libraries around Montana. Uh, our biggest effort to date has been supporting a hotspot lending program. And we have a, a dashboard that provides more information about that program. Um, again, we have 83 libraries that are currently lending hotspots. Five of those are academic libraries. We have a handful of tribal libraries that are lending hotspots and then the, the remainder are public libraries. Um, this data I think is about a month out of date at this point, but um, you can see we've had some pretty significant increases in use of the hotspot lending program as people have become more aware of it and as it's become more important. You heard Don say that we're, we're 50th in the nation for broadband access. And so it was absolutely critical for us to do what we can to get hotspots in the hands of libraries so that they could get them in the hands of their patrons. A couple of quick points I wanted to make about this program. We are using state of Montana term contracts with Verizon and T-Mobile, as well as a telecommunication provider in far Northeastern Montana to provide these hotspots. They're all the property of the Montana State Library and we pay the data fees each month for these services. They all have unlimited access to data. Uh, and then um, we've given them to libraries for libraries to lend to their patrons. We also have some user feedback information that uh, we gather. This is a volunteer survey that patrons can complete. So it's by no means comprehensive but it gives you just a little bit of information about how the hotspots have been used and, and for what purposes they've been used. So for example, 9% uh, of those persons completing the survey say they're using these hotspots to complete homework uh, from home and other kinds of specific needs. One of the things that Jen mentioned that I really appreciate is taking a data-driven approach to thinking about how we deploy these hotspots. I think that's really important for us as we're looking at these kinds of programs. Uh, we initially targeted a number of hotspots per library. Uh, with the addition of the ARPA funds, our goal is to get to one hotspot per 1,500 people in the state. Uh, that's a, a relatively common metric for deploying hotspot programs. And we think with the addition of the ARPA funds, we should be able to get there. We're currently serving 44 of Montana's 56 counties. We wanna to get to all 56 counties. And then as Jen said, uh, we really wanna start looking at some more of the, the demographic and connectivity data that exists, overlaying that information with information about the availability of hotspots so that we can use some of our ARPA funds to be even more targeted in future deployment of those hotspots to make sure that we're maximizing that investment. Um, being 50th in the country, Montana is planning to use a significant amount of the ARPA funds coming to the state to try to create that kind of broadband strategy that we currently lack and our legislature is currently looking at legislation that would create a task force uh, and a technical advisory committee that would help us create a broadband plan. We don't have a broadband plan at this point. And to begin to think about how we invest those dollars. Um, the amount of funding through ARPA, though significant, isn't nearly enough to wholly address the needs in Montana. And so we're very anxiously watching additional federal funds that we hope will come to help support broadband and looking at some of the other funding sources available through ARPA that can help begin to address the need. Um, one of our goals is to try to secure additional ARPA funds beyond the IMLS funds to help sustain this hotspot lending program beyond 2022 because the need in Montana is going to exist far beyond September of 2022. And we think there are other paths within ARPA, within the funds that are available to our state and other sources of funds to, to help us extend that kind of program. 
And then the other need that we hope to address in uh, Montana is a significant lack of upgrades to internal wiring within libraries. Uh, many of our 82 public libraries have not had the funding to upgrade their internal wiring since the BTOP days a decade ago. And we're still using routers in some places that are 10 years old and, and other kinds of needs. And so we plan to use some of our opera funds to address those needs. Uh, we used the Internet 2 Towards Gigabit Libraries Toolkit, uh, if you're familiar with that tool at all. Uh, we conducted a study two years ago where we completed that toolkit for all 82 public libraries as well as their branches. And so we have really good data about where the greatest needs are to help us determine how best to employ those, those funds. Um, I've been doing a lot of talking and I, I see we're coming up on 10. And, and as Jen said, we wanted to make this a little bit of a dialogue. So Jen, I wanted to ask you, uh, how do what you're seeing in New Jersey compare to what you know is going on in Minnesota? That's a great question, Jenny. Thanks for asking. Um, I came to New Jersey in February, so I was uh, in Minnesota for the last CARES Act, and of course, I'm still connected with folks there. Um, one of the things that's very true about Minnesota is um, that grant process to allow um, local libraries to make applications is probably the number one uh, area that they're looking at um, for spending at least half their funds um, to allow libraries to come in and do projects of between, let's say, $10,000 and $200,000. Um, so to really make some significant investments or allow libraries to make significant investments. Um, the state in Minnesota doesn't do a lot of the online, uh, doesn't do any actually of the online electronic resource subscriptions or database mm -hmm. subscriptions. So the state isn't using any of the money um, to support those kinds of products. Um, whereas I know in some states, uh, New Jersey included, um, that's been one focus of, of how the funds are used. Um, in Minnesota with the CARES Fund, we uh, did a, again, a data-driven uh, decision to give um, three library systems that cover about two thirds of the state geographically, um, uh, 100, more than $100,000 to do work related to digital equity and also gave uh, some of money to each of our, the state's four tribal college libraries, knowing that the needs there are really um, significant, not just for the students at the college, but for their families. Um, one of the things that's true about Minnesota is it's the land of 10,000 lakes and lakes get in the way of establishing really good connectivity because yeah. you do a little bit of plowing and then there's a lake or a river. And so that geographic barrier uh, comes into play. So something like the hotspots um, are very valuable in areas where um, there, there can't be land, uh, land lines or fiber lines that way. Um, so, um, uh, so, so yeah, so a little bit different. Um, I know we have a couple of our other colleagues from other states are on the call with us. Um, I, I think um, one of the things that's sort of true about state libraries is if you've seen one of them, you've seen one of them, there is so much variation between what we do and how we're able to do it given the parameters of our state governments and where we sit in state government. The New Jersey State Library is an affiliate of Thomas Edison State University, which is kind of unusual, um, but it allows us some flexibility uh, that uh, my colleague Jenny doesn't have um, because of her position in state government. So we're always, as state librarians, kind of negotiating that relationship with the state government in a way that we hope is going to be beneficial and really uh, a benefit to libraries. Um, Jenny, one question I had for you is you're talking about the hotspot program. I kept thinking about capacity of your staff. Do you have, um, how many staff have you assigned to be doing this work? Uh, that's a really good question. We have three library consultants and their responsibility has been to help uh, educate and promote the program to libraries. And then we have a grant and contracts administrator who's been responsible for helping to take advantage of those state term contracts and actually doing that procurement of the hotspots. And then we've used some of our federal funds to hire 
a temporary staff person who's responsible for shipping the hotspots out to libraries and taking care of any kind of maintenance needs that have come up uh, with managing the hotspots. So, um, you know, in, in total, it's probably been between one and a half and two FTE that we've been dedicating to that program. Okay. Can I follow up on that? Can I follow up on that on that uh, question about uh, staffing? And, and uh, uh, Mark Cole will ask about uh, Jenny. Uh, do you have a, a common, uh, a single wireless provider for all these hotspots? We use Verizon and T-Mobile primarily, and then neither of those provide providers adequately serve the far northeast northeastern corner of Montana. And we have a local telecommunication provider called Nemont up there. They've been a fantastic partner. Uh, the costs for their hotspots were a little bit more than what we budgeted uh, per hotspot and they were willing to match the costs. So we were able to bring that program to far Northeastern Montana within our budget. Excellent. Uh, on the staffing question, there's a kind of wider issue about these funds are coming, but they have to be managed, right? IMLS is suffering from staff shortage because they're budgeted to do what they do. And then they get almost twice as much funds, but yeah. they're not staffing up. They're not able to staff. Are you able to use some of these funds to increase staff so that you can actually take advantage of the funds and manage them properly? This for both of you. IMLS limits uh, the, the indirect costs that we can claim for these funds to 4%. So 4% doesn't go very far, but we do have the ability to use some of the direct funds to hire staff as well. Um, so as I said, we've hired a temporary staff person to help manage that hotspot program. Jen, what have you done? We have um, chosen to only use it um, to hire somebody to do the outreach with our talking book and braille center. Um, other than that, what I've done to accommodate this staffing need is to reassign staff. We've decided that this is a priority and um, are putting all hands on deck. So um, I have a, I think a larger library agency than Jenny does. So I've got probably five or six staff members that are spending some time, uh, some of their time with it, including a grants administrator, um, library development consultants, and uh, program managers. So um, it's very much a team effort to be able to get it out the door. And I'm actually really looking forward, it's probably sound kind of odd, but um, I'm looking forward to reporting on the use of these funds. One of the federal requirements is that we provide a report about how things uh, what we did with the money and what the impact was. And I just see so much potential here that I'm really excited to be able to um, turn back to IMLS and tell them about all the great things that our libraries have been able to do with the resources. That's great. Hey, Jen, do you, do you have just one anecdote or example that you wanna share? Um, you know, um, we're not at, well, uh, yeah, actually I do. Um, it's with our CARES funds. Um, we had some money left over from uh, the ways we'd spent it initially, about $160,000. So when I came on board in February, I said, well, let's do a competitive grant. Let's let people apply. Um, we closed the grant application period uh, two weeks ago for $160,000 that we said we have available, we received 95 applications for over $570,000 worth of projects, which was outstanding. Um, so I, clearly there's a need out there. Um, that particular grant was crafted around digital equity and supporting digital equity. Um, the other issue with it is the funds are available for them for CARES through September, 2021. So these are all people that were, and it had, projects in mind that they can complete in three months that would add to uh, digital equity in the community. So that was just uh, amazing to, to see the response to that. A little scary and a little bit disappointing that we're not able to serve all those needs, but I'm thinking with our second ARPA funds, we'll be able to do a little bit more in that area. Good, good. You, you, that's an interesting point, uh, Jen, uh, that, the CARES funding 
has kind of activated a new level of proposal writing and thinking and planning about this. And so that should provide an additional platform for new funds. So people are in proposal writing mode now, would you say that's true and, and are more ready to respond to the, the new opportunities coming at us? Yeah, very much so. Um, in New Jersey, we also have a library construction bond act, uh, the grant opportunity that's open now. And same thing, we're just getting tremendous response to that. Um, and people really seem to be, I, I would say, wired for it um, in a really nice way. And we try um, to make things as easy as possible for people so not to ask for lots of extraneous information, but really, um, you know, tell us what you want to do, why you want to do it, and how it's going to make a difference is really the kind of focus. Should mention too, and Jenny, um, this I know this is true for Montana as well. Um, we are guided in using these funds since they're from the Grants to States program. Uh, we're guided in using them also by a Library Services and Technology Act five year plan that we develop on a state basis. So we have to make sure our funding is spent in alignment with that. So um, in Minnesota, for example, um, connectivity was. Uh, excuse me, I shouldn't say connectivity, resource sharing uh, was a really important aspect of it, as well as um, equity of access to information. So some of the funds there, the funds were used kind of with that kind of umbrella. Jenny, with your LSTA plan, what are your some of your larger categories or things you're looking at? Um, digital content, digital inclusion are, are some of our, our key priorities that I, I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, in addition to broadband connectivity. Um, it's, it's certainly a struggle for a lot of our libraries in Montana, unlike what, what Jen said, we do invest in statewide procurement of e-resources. We don't subscribe to a lot of databases. Uh, we do mo mostly e-book and e-audio procurement, and we're looking at licensing a few other uh, different kinds of e-resources. Uh, our, our public libraries have done pretty well and we've been able to significantly invest in, in kind of spurts of investment to make sure that our public libraries are meeting demand. Our school libraries have really struggled in Montana. Um, the schools fall under our state office of public instruction and they haven't seen any kind of dedicated funding for procurement of e-resources when our schools began to support remote learning. And so uh, in addition to the CARES Act funds, we were able to use some funds from our governor in, in a little different pot of funding to procure some additional e-resources. And we just decided at the State Library to split that funding in thirds between public school and academic libraries to help address some of those kinds of needs. And I know that we'll be planning to do the same thing uh, with some of the ARPA funds that we have. The other point that I wanted to, to make in response to Don's comments about seeing libraries sort of in proposal writing mode is that while we can't use federal funds to support advocacy work, this Montana State Library has some other sources of funding. And we're currently in the process of contracting with a local development cooperative who will be working with our public libraries to help them draft proposals so that they can seek some additional both state funds as well, well as funds from their local governments. And um, so, so far we've had just some brainstorming sessions amongst some of our libraries to help them think about some of the ideas and needs that they have that might uh, be allowable under the, the ARPA requirements. And then our hope is that through these contractors, uh, libraries can either develop pro proposals on their own or perhaps come together and develop some collaborative proposals. And so we hope to see local libraries getting more of these funds at the local level as well. Great point. Uh... <laughs> It's a great point about state funds because we, you know, we've identified sort of funding streams that directly are aimed at or include libraries, you know, federal funds. But the vast majority of the federal funds are covering a broad range of, of topics 
going to the state governments themselves under which they may then provide additional funds to the libraries under you know broader infrastructure or the various other programs so do That's you exactly right do you have your own kind of focal point within the states i know jenny you you know you both are on here partly because you have such different environments and that's mm -hmm. that's representative of kind of the whole country we have a big range of people communities states and so forth and yet we all have to kind of deal with this common uh issue of the of the pandemic but uh, Jen, do you have a focal point for broadband policy and funding streams within the state do you interact with? You know, we don't. Um, the state just uh, passed legislation to create a broadband study commission for the first time. So there isn't currently a home, if you will, for broadband in the state. So mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that'll come out of uh, the work of the, the committee. And we were excited that um, a librarian was written into the the team. So we will have library representation on the Broadband Study Commission. So That's it's a little great. bit of a victory. So I'm glad That's to great. see that. Je Jenny, it seems like you are the state broadband commission. Well, I hope for not much longer, but the hat I don't wear, wear very proudly. So yeah. there are, in addition to the work that the state library is supporting, there will be significant investment. Right now, it's looking like the state is going to support some RFPs to providers to bring uh, connectivity to unserved and underserved areas. And there's lots of debate about um, whether or not to be technology agnostic or to support uh, wire, wireless, uh, what it means to be unserved and underserved. So I hope that in the, the waning days of our legislative session, they can come to agreement on some of those definitions and, and get that legislation moving forward. I, well, I see a comment. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I see a comment in the chat from Richard about uh, right. cyber security and securing networks. Uh, Richard, what I was going to say is at the Montana State Library, we don't really have a technology consultant on staff. So we are partnering with our state information technology services division and some contractors available through them. And we're really supporting the idea of managed services programs that libraries can invest in to help them manage their networks better and to support network security needs for their libraries, um, both within the library and then thinking beyond the library. So that, that's a need that we're going to need to contract out for. Jen, you have these security uh, concerns as well? You know, I'm not close enough to, to the work to really have a good sense of that, so I wouldn't want to comment. Uh, sure. It is, uh, it is, of course, an issue when you have, you know, a public access service open to anyone to come in. It's, it's a wonderful thing, but it's also a vulnerability for sure. And so <laughs> we're all having to evolve in this stuff, this technology, this tsunami of technology that's that is also transforming civilization at an ever faster rate and that the libraries seem to be kind of pushed to the forefront because they provide access to so many people. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have, wanted uh, to go ahead. I wanted to share a quick anecdote from uh, actually two, if I might, from our hotspot lending program. Uh, one, there is a, a vaccination clinic in Missoula, Montana that didn't have any kind of internet connectivity and of course needed internet access to record information about people who were being vaccinated. And so that clinic actually worked with the university there to check out one of our hotspots to provide connectivity at the vaccination clinic. I thought that was a great story. That and then, you know, we, 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 we think about economic development and education needs most primarily when we think about this hotspot lending program, but um, we received a thank you from a minister in one of Montana's small rural communities who was needing to host a funeral this last fall for a family in the community. And of course, because of the pandemic, family members couldn't travel and be together for that funeral service. It was held in a cemetery and she checked out a hotspot from her local library and hosted the funeral via Zoom 
and family members could be together in that virtual environment, supporting one another in their loss. And she said, what, what an amazing opportunity the hotspots created for that kind of opportunity. There, there must be a lot of those kinds of stories. Uh, I have one related to that. It's kind of topical because right now the uh, emergency E-rate fund is being finalized. We're all making comments that are actually due today. If, if any of you have been thinking about that, we've, we've done a workshop on how to submit a comment to the FCC, and we encourage everybody to, to do that if, if, if you have any time at all. But it's, uh, uh, the, the concern is that this $7 billion uh, going to schools and libraries will mostly just go to buying more hotspots and maybe some tablets and stuff, as opposed to building any kind of more fixed infrastructure. Uh, have you, have you, either of you thought about using, or you know of any cases where people are using these uh, checkout hotspots to provide kind of public access, like in a community center, to use a, a checkout hotspot to create a, a, a common access point? Don, I know in Montana, we sure are. Uh, we've, we've seen them used in senior centers, for example, grocery stores. Uh, last summer, and I expect this coming summer, they were used a lot at our, our county fairs where people were coming together and needing access uh, in our county fair settings. Great, great. Jen, are you doing, hearing any of that? Um, not a lot. Um, I get, I'm getting the sense that the hotspot programs aren't as widespread in New Jersey as they are in some of the other states, Minnesota included. Um, so uh, I know in Minnesota, they definitely were uh, in particular in the tribal communities, um, creating smaller areas um, within, uh, within a, a reservation. Right. We, we have just put together a filing under this, uh, this particular uh, emergency uh, E-rate fund uh, that asked the FCC to allocate uh, a proportion of the, of the $7 billion to libraries. You know, they're like 12% of the facilities are library facilities compared to schools. And, and they get less under E-rate proportionally than the schools do. And yet, you know, they support everybody, including all the students. And, and so we've proposed that, you know, they specifically allocate some $850 million to libraries and give libraries and schools full flexibility on how they spend this money, not try to narrow it down to this much on this type of technology or communications that, that these communities understand their needs better than, than these grant makers and give them the flexibility to address their needs at the local level. And if they just, if, if doing what Jenny just described in Montana, libraries could set up, you know, 100,000 new fixed public access hotspots for, you know, what is it, uh, $500 for two years, something like that. It would be a few hundred million dollars and serve tens of millions of people. Uh, it's a question about how far this money will go, but there's more coming. Uh, I had another question about buildings because there's another building fund being discussed right now. And what, how do you see kind of the future of the spaces? I know we've talked a lot about technology and, and access, but these are also important, valuable spaces in communities. How do you imagine the, the library of tomorrow, you know, in, in this extended kind of pandemic or is there, you have big building deferred maintenance and, and then there's the ongoing redesign of the facilities themselves. What, what do you see for the future for, for buildings? You know, I, I think most libraries will retain, retain the footprint, if you will. Um, as you were talking though, what came to my mind was the image of outlets um, in terms of electrical outlets. And I worked in a 1960s library for many years and the, you know, as the internet and computer resources were coming on and the last printer on the first floor got triggered, everything shut down. So that wiring is really um, is crucial to the libraries. And we have a lot of older libraries in New Jersey that are, are facing that. So just some of that basic thing. Um, 
I've also um, been aware of libraries that are really looking, and I think the key word is flexibility. They're really looking at how to create spaces that can be flexible to um, address lots of people, small amounts of people, the need for quiet, the need for sound and that sort of thing. So um, I'm guessing it probably is kind of familiar in, in Montana, but um, maybe you have some examples too, Jenny. I think that's exactly right, Jen. We're really looking to the future of work and what office space looks like and educational spaces look like. You know, we're, we're certainly talking a lot about sort of uh, hybrid workspace models, allowing for some cafe style workspaces. And we already see a need in library buildings for collaborative workspaces for uh, small business operators and entrepreneurs to come together and have space where they can collaborate. I think there's going to be even more opportunity for that kind of collaboration to happen in a post pandemic model. And I think there's a great opportunity for libraries to really play that role of entrepreneur and economic development support and need to be thinking about how we design our spaces to support those kinds of collaborative work models in the future. I think one That's of the great. things that was called to my attention recently about um, buildings and particularly reconstruction are those um, number of buildings out there that we have that are historically preserved or historically protected, which starts to put some boundaries around um, how, how renovation can happen and what it can look like to retain the integrity of the historical building. So we're finding that in New Jersey there, obviously it's an old state, there's lots of old buildings. Um, older buildings. Um, and that's an issue that our libraries are having to deal with wanting to, to address those historic preservation needs while also becoming modern and efficient. So I'm, I, once the pandemic's over, I'm looking forward to a tour of the libraries to see how they're working with that particular issue. That's great. a great point, Jen. We, uh, one of our most popular sessions, actually the most popular session was uh, around, we had some architects come on and yeah. we had the greatest number of signups for that session. So there's a lot of thinking about these spaces and the design, the ongoing demands and changing demands of these spaces. And uh, the thing that came up was sort of this inside out model. Of course, they were tightly closed at the time of the session, but you know, the light, and you mentioned it, Jen, the, the outlet kind of opportunities, what kind of extensions the library can create physical places as well as digital access spaces uh, is really an interesting topic to think about as we go forward. Uh, I'd like to, we're kind of up on an hour now. And so I'd like to ask you both to kind of summarize or conclude with a call to action. I should have warned you a little earlier about this when we were setting up the session, but this is what we usually ask of our guests to, uh, you know, to, Okay, we've spent some time. We've talked about a bunch of things, but what would you what would you advise? What would you uh, call people to take action on, uh, Jen? I uh, you know I think going back to the idea of the partnerships and relationships, I would encourage people to be in touch with their local governments as well as um, state government outside the library agency to really get um, projects going uh, with funds available through those entities. I think of the Department of Labor related to workforce, the Department of Education, of course. Um, there's a lot of money coming from the local government and uh, libraries need to um, remind people that um, we are essential institutions and um, fit right into a community's learning ecosystem and really need to be treated as such. Um, so my call to action would be to um, have folks looking um, at some of those other local sources of funding to help build stronger relationships with communities. Very good. Yeah, amen. I, I, I was thinking the exact same thing, Jen. This is such an opportunity for libraries to really demonstrate how critically essential we are in our communities. Uh, I think really thinking about the impact of the services that we have and thinking about how we can collect data and gather stories to talk about the impact of the services that we're supporting are, are really, really critical. There's a lot of money out there and libraries should not be afraid to ask for our pieces of the pie. 
Um, so look and seek and find partners and, and don't be afraid to ask, uh, even if you get told no, um, express the need because the, the needs are very real. I think the other point that I would make is that you really need to be much more future focused in the thinking we have about our services. Uh, um, how is technology going to change our services in the future? Uh, how can we be better prepared when these kinds of emergencies arise in the future? Uh, and what kinds of costs are we going to incur when we face those kinds of challenges in the future so that we can articulate those needs now so that uh, when we come asking for funds both now and in the future, we have real needs that we can talk about. No, that's great. Uh, your, your point about services is well made. Uh, we've, we've started referring to libraries as the Swiss army knife of public institutions. Mm -hmm. That every time somebody dreams up a new need, they can't figure out how to do it. They say, well, the libraries can do it, you know, like a new e-government story. Well, I don't have access. Well, go to the library. Uh, uh, well, what about telehealth? Well, go to the library, a, a subject we're going to get into. Uh, thank you both very much. This has been excellent. Uh, this is, this is a, a focus we have just now on the roles of state libraries. We're going to have uh, another state library or two next week, so tune in for that. Uh, because they are so pivotal to how we're responding in this pandemic, because they serve more people in more ways than anyone else by a lot. And it's just not well understood or appreciated. Everybody, nobody dislikes libraries, but they tend to take them for granted. And it's been our yeah. mission to try to rectify that and make people appreciate this essential service. And, and I then, think we're, we're guilty of letting them take us for granted. And, and I think we're, we're guilty of, of sort of having a poverty mentality and we can't allow that to happen in the future. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll do a session on assertiveness training. Absolutely, yes. Jen? I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, okay. um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to finally meet you, Don. Um, and I would encourage if anyone has specific questions about what I'm doing in Minnesota and New Jersey, um, feel free to reach out. I suspect Jenny's the same. We're wide open to conversations. And these are topics that are really important to us as, as leaders in the library field. Terrific. Well, we uh, will close the recorded session now. We tend to hang out for a few minutes afterwards for just open mic, but uh, I want to thank both of our speakers and ask everyone to unmute. If you would, everyone unmute, please, for a moment. We want to uh, we want to thank our speakers as we would if we were in person. We would give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this recording should be up by Monday, and I uh, hope you all have a happy weekend. And that concludes this session for now. Thank you.